Okay, so in this video we want to start to now be able to calculate um, probabilities from the normal distribution which um, don't necessarily involve values that are one, two or three standard deviations away from the mean. So in the previous video um, we looked at the 68.95.99.7% rule which enables us to calculate or approximate probabilities um, where we're dealing with values that are one, two or three standard deviations away from the mean. Um, obviously we're going to be dealing with plenty of other problems where the value that we're interested in is not a nice um, one, two or three standard deviations away from the mean. So we need to be able to calculate normal probabilities. Now te technically this does involve an integral. Okay, so it's an, it's an integral uh, underneath that complicated probability density function to find a probability in the same way that we would for any other continuous random variable. But because this is quite a commonly used distribution, our CAS has specific um, uh, functions set up in order to enable us to calculate probabilities involving the normal distribution. Um, and so this video is really going to be quite nuts and bolts about how do we how do we use the CAS to get answers. Okay. Um, the next video will similarly be a bit nuts and bolts. How do we use the CAS if it is um, the mean or the standard deviation that's unknown in a normal um, distribution problem? And then the final video will be more applied problems, so worded problems where you actually need to kind of draw the information out a little bit more from the question. Um, okay, so in terms of where we're going to find our useful normal probability um, tools in the CAS menu, uh, five for distribu uh, five for probability, five again for distributions, and then the first three options here, one, two, and three, are all um, normal options. Now, as we saw with binomial distribution, there is a, the option of binomial PDF and binomial CDF, and we learnt that in the binomial distribution, we would use binomial PDF if we were trying to find the probability that x is equal to a particular value, and we use binomial CDF if we're trying to use, find the probability that x is, you know, over a range of values or between you know, bigger than something or less than something or between two things. Um, and the same logic is true for normal um, probabilities, which brings into question why there is a normal PDF function given that um, the probability of x equaling a particular value in a normal distribution is zero because it's a continuous probability distribution. So we will only be using um, numbers two and three in this menu. So normal CDF to find cumulative probabilities um, involving the normal distribution and inverse normal which we'll talk about a little later on um, in this video. Um, Okay, so let's just use it practically. Um, you, there's some instructions written in that box uh, there, but let's have a look at, at some examples to utilise it. Um, suppose that Z is a standard normal distribution. Now, the first thing you'll all want to ask me when you start this exercise, when you get to a question that's phrased exactly the same as this one, is how do I know what's the mean and what's the standard deviation? Standard normal distribution. Mean is zero, standard deviation is one. Okay. If you get stuck when you get to the exercise, come back to this example and it'll all become clear again. Um, so we want to suppose that Z is a standard normal um, vari random variable. So that is a normal random, normally distributed variable with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Find correct to four decimal places the following probabilities. Draw an appropriate diagram in each case. Okay, so probability that Z is less than 2.3. All right, so if I draw my diagram here, probability that z is less than 2.3 and I'm not suggesting the diagram is necessary for you to uh, obtain the answer but it's really important that you get in the habit of sort of visualizing what you're looking for gives you a sense of roughly how big am I expecting my answer to be it also means that you avoid having to do unnecessary calculations where you actually already have the answer for example here answering part a will enable us to find the answers we need for part b and part c straight away um, so and when we draw the diagram that becomes quite clear so it's a standard normal um, variable, so standard deviation of 1, so this is sort of 1, 2, 3, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. So if we want the probability of z being less than 2.3, 2.3 is maybe somewhere up here. And so we want that total area there is what we're finding. So we're expecting quite a big probability here, certainly more than half, um, but equally definitely more than 95%, given that we know that within two standard deviations of the mean is 95%. Uh, so um, in terms of actually calculating, so uh, menu 552 for normal CDF. Our lower bound here is negative infinity, so we're going from negative infinity up to 
to 2.3. That's the span of the values we want. So lower bound negative infinity, upper bound 2.3. <coughs> Mean and standard deviation are by default set for the standard normal, so we don't need to edit any of that. And so we press enter here, and we find that this probability is approximately zero point, we want four decimal places, 9893 to four decimal places. Okay, in um, part B, we want the probability that Z is bigger than 2.3. So that means we want, if this was 2.3 up here, we want this probability. So as I said, we actually don't need our cas again, because if we recognise that this is just 1 minus the probability that z is now bigger than or equal to, it says here, and less than, so that's fine. But remember that with a continuous random variable, the um, probability that z equals 2.3 is 0. So even if this said greater than, it would still be equal to 1 minus the probability that z is less than 2.3. Okay, so we can use our cas to do 1 minus this value. And so it is 0 0.0107, correct, to four decimal places. Probability that Z is less than negative 2.3. Okay, so again, a bell curve, mean at zero, standard deviation of one, so negative 2.3. Okay, it's going to be down here, but we're definitely going to have some symmetry with what we found in the previous question. So probability that Z is less than negative 2.3, well, that's actually the same as the probability that Z is bigger than 2.3, which we already know from part B is 0 0.0107. Okay, so not doing unnecessary calculations. Having said that, it's not difficult to calculate these other probabilities um, with the CAS, but once we've got our answer in part A, it enables us to answer parts B and part C. And developing that sense of the symmetry of the normal distribution is really important. Um, it's a really useful thing. So part D, probability that Z is uh, bigger than or equal to negative 1.2 and less than 2.4. Now remember the fact that these are different is making absolutely no difference. This could be a less than as well. This could be a less than or equal to. They're all the same question. Okay. All right. So Z negative 1.2 and positive 2.4. Okay. So again, let's have zero. So sort of one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three. Um, and so therefore negative 1.2 is going to be about here up to 2.4 is going to be about here and so we want to, we're essentially finding that area in under there and we can get our cars to do that for us so menu 552 for normal CDF our lower bound in this case is negative 1.2 our upper bound is 2.4 uh, and mean and standard deviation are fine as they are. And so correct to four decimal places, 0 0.8767. So again, I was expecting quite a big probability here, certainly bigger than a half um, and definitely, you know, closer to one than 0.5. Um, so that makes sense in the scheme of what I'm seeing. Okay, um, part E, find the probability that Z is bigger than or equal to negative 2.4 and less than 1.2. So let's have a think about what's happening here. Okay, so negative 2.4 is going to be about there. Positive 1.2 is going to be about there. And actually what we recognize here is that this is exactly the same area. It's the mirror image of um, part D. So this is actually exactly the same as the probability um, that Z is between negative 1.2 and positive 2.4. It's just reflected um, around the mean, which in this case is zero. And so therefore we know that's gonna be exactly the same as the answer we just found, 0.8767. And then finally, we want the probability that Z is bigger than zero, bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, mean of zero. And so therefore, probability that Z is bigger than or equal to zero, we can clearly see that that's exactly half of the distribution. So we don't even need our CAS. This will be 0.5. So the probability that Z is, probability that any variable is bigger than its mean or less than its mean, is going to be 0.5 okay so recognizing that it's the mean that you have um, is going to enable you to, to very quickly answer the question 
Okay, example two. So suppose that x is a normal random variable with mean of mu uh, sorry mean of sixty and standard deviation of seven. Okay, so we don't need um, so we need to adjust the mean and standard deviation here. It's not a standard normal variable. Um, it's got a, a mean that isn't zero and a standard deviation that isn't one. But that's no more complicated with our case. So we want the probability that x is less than or equal to fifty two. Um, it says we don't need to draw diagrams here. But again, you might want to think a bit sometimes about the sort of symmetries that you've got happening. So, you know, for example, x being less than 52, thinking about the fact that the mean is um, 60 in this case, and obviously standard deviation of 7, so, you know, 67 and 74 and uh, what's that going to be, 81 are key values in terms of being 1, 2 and 3 standard deviations above the mean. Uh, 53, 66, no, sorry, 46, 46 and 39, etc. are also key values. So think about where does 52 go? Okay, well, 52 is just a little bit less than one standard deviation below the mean. Probability that x is less than or equal to 52. So we're looking at this probability down here. So definitely less than half and um, quite a bit less than half, probably almost, probably less than 0.25 as well. Um, just looking at that, but we can get our CAS to calculate it for us. So menu 552, lower bound is negative infinity again, upper bound is, sorry, upper bound is 52, mean is 60, standard deviation is 7. Correct to four decimal places, this probability is approximately equal to 0 0.1265. So yeah, so that's right, certainly less than 0.25. Um, Okay, so then we want the probability that x is bigger than 72. Okay, so I can see that 72 is going to be, looks similar, it's not symmetrically above, that's 12 above the mean, whereas um, whereas the previous question was 8 below the mean, so there's no symmetry here that's going to be useful. So 60, as we said, sort of, you know, 67 and 74, etc. So therefore it's going to be a bit less than two standard deviations above the mean and we want the probability that x is bigger than that. So again we're looking at um, a probability fairly close to what we got in the previous one, a bit less than that. So menu 552, normal CDF. This time our lower bound is 72 and our upper bound is positive infinity. So we get infinity from the, um, well we can get it in a few places, but probably the quickest way is the little pi button down next to the letter H. Um, and it is in that little menu there. Uh, mean is 60, standard deviation is 7. Okay, so this probability is 0 0.0432, correct, four decimal places. Find the probability that X is bigger than 48 um, and also less than or equal to 72. Okay, so thinking a bit about what we've got happening here. So this time 48 and 72 are both symmetrically placed about the mean. Okay, so it's going to be a nice um, symmetric area. So again, you know, this was uh, 53 and this was uh, 46 and this was 67 and this is 74. And so therefore, um, 48 and 72 are both, you know, symmetrically placed. And so therefore, we're looking at a nice symmetric area here. So if you wanted to, you could find the area from 60 to 72 and double it, or from 48 to 60 and double it. There'd be no reason to do that in particular, but um, just worth noting this information. Uh, and so... Um, this is going to be menu 552. So lower bound in this case is 48, upper bound is 72, mean is 60, standard deviation is 7. And so this is approximately equal to 0.9135. Now we're never going to write the CAS syntax on our paper. When we get to the application problems, I'll talk more about precisely what you need to write here. The key information is that the it's normally distributed, which is given in the question that you've identified the mean, which is explicitly given in the question here, that you've identified the standard deviation, which is explicitly given in the question here, 
that you've written down the probability that you're calculating and you write down what it's equal to. Okay, so you don't write norm CDF, etc. That's the language you use to talk to your CAS. It's not mathematics. Okay, so as I said, we'll talk more about how to set it up more fully if you haven't been given the information as explicitly in the question here um, when we get to the application problems a little further on. But I want to be really clear about you should never never be writing norm CDF, binom PDF, binom CDF, inv norm you know, all the different things, um, you know, inverse binomial n, you should never be writing that syntax on the exam paper. That's the way you communicate with your CAS. It's not the way you communicate the mathematics. Okay, so um, in your, at the back of your booklets, there's a, um, a sheet, which is what you should write down when you're solving a probability problem. Um, students often get confused here because the CAS is doing a lot of the work for them, but it's still really important that you're able to communicate effectively the information that you had to tell the CAS. Okay, so as I said, we'll talk more about that in the um, two videos time. I'll show you, I'll display that worksheet here as well, but or that handout, sorry, here as well. But for early reference, it is at the back of your booklet. Uh, okay, so we've got our probability in part C. Now part D, we want a conditional probability. So that is the probability that X is less than 60, given that X is between 48 and 72, which is the probability we've just found in part C. So we know that when we do conditional probabilities, um, sorry, that this is going to be equal to the intersection of those two things. So x being less than 60 and, sorry, less than 60, struggling today, and between 48 and 72. The other thing I'd say to you, whilst it technically doesn't matter what's what here, whether we would get the same answer if this was a less than or equal to, or if this was just a less than or whatever, um, you should still make sure that you're answering the question that's being asked. So don't just randomly change them for no reason here, even though it would give you the same value. Make sure that you're still answering the question being asked. And that's also more applicable when we deal with the worded problems. If the question says, find the probability that someone takes longer than 20 seconds, then your probability of T being bigger than 20. You, make, you must make sure you directly interpret the question. Okay, so um, we want, need to think about what that intersection is. And then it's over the second thing, which we've already found out in um, in part C. Now, if we think about probability, if X has to be both less than 60, now 60 is the mean. So we know that the probability, we, what we're really talking about, if we add to our diagram we've got over here, the probability of X being less than 60 and between 48 and 72 is this bit here. Okay, so it's that green area over the purple area, which actually, if we think about it, is going to be one half, okay? We know immediately that this is going to be one half, okay? So you really don't need, we could, yes, find the intermediate step here, which wouldn't be necessary where we found these probabilities. We identify that this intersection is the probability that X is bigger than 60 and less than or equal to 72. And we find that probability, menu 552, so 60 to 72, mean of 60 and a standard deviation of 7. And we then divide that by um, the answer we found in part C. And we find, oh, look, it's 0.499999 recurring, which if we round to four decimal places will be 0 0.5000. Um, but it's actually, it's actually precisely 0.5. Okay, so this is just a, an issue with your CAS's level of rounding that it's got here. So yes, you could by all means work out these two different things. It'd be 0.4568 divided by your previous answer, 0.9135. We wouldn't use rounded answers. We'd use the nice exact answers like we did in our CAS here. And our CAS tells us that it's approximately 0 0.5000 to four decimal places, but actually it's exactly 0.5 if we just think about the diagram, as I said, um, you know, this is this is not a necessary line of calculation here because we've got all the information we need just looking at the diagram. This is where sketching it and, and doing a rough sketch of the bell curve, it doesn't need all the numbers, just get a sense of, you know, is it symmetric about the mean? Is it big up above the mean? Wherever, get a sense of what's happening and that will honestly, it will help you. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to draw a graph. Okay, example three. Scores obtained on an IQ test are normally distributed with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So we've used this example frequently. Find correct to four decimal places the probability that a person has an IQ over 140. Okay, so the first thing here is that there's no variable defined for me in the question. It doesn't say X is IQ score or whatever. Okay, so we need to identify that ourselves. 
okay? I might say that, I might call it Q. Q equals IQ score. I know that Q is a normally distributed variable, we've talked about this notation in a previous video, with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. But remember, this notation doesn't use standard deviation, it uses variance. We don't, I'm not ever, however going to work out what 15 squared is, I'm just going to write 15 squared. So if you're going to use this notation, you must make sure that this number here is variance. Okay, parameters are mean and variance in this notation. We are looking for, in terms of what this probability is, question is asking us, the probability that Q, the IQ score, is over 140, is bigger than 140. So as I said previously, whilst it would be, it will give us the same answer if we write bigger than or equal to 140, the question doesn't ask for the probability that a person has an IQ of at least 140, it asks that their IQ be over 140. So make sure that the way you describe the probability is an accurate representation of what the sentence actually says. Okay. All right, so menu 552, lower bound here is 140, we want bigger than 140, upper bound will be infinity. Um, our mean is 100 and our standard deviation is 15. And we find that the probability of someone having an IQ more than 140 is 0 0.0038, correct to four decimal places. Okay, That makes sense. We know that 145 is three standard deviations above the mean. We know that only um, you know, 0.3 of a percent um, have a probability, have an IQ over 145. You know, again, if you'd drawn your diagram, you would have been really clear that this is definitely going to be a very small value. Um, part B, find correct four decimal places the probability that, that a person has an IQ of 95 or less. Now, in part B, I've already defined my variable and my distribution up here in part A, so I don't need to do that again. This question would pro probably worth, you know, two marks at part A and one mark at part B one mark up here for the the definition of what's happening and the other mark for your probability whereas here we don't need to redefine the variable again it's the same variable we're still talking about q just as we defined it in the previous part but this time we want the probability that a person has an iq of 95 or less so less than or equal to 95 and we can calculate the probability so menu 552 lower bound is negative infinity upper bound is 95, we know 95 is less than the mean of 100, so it's going to be a probability of less than 50%, um, sorry, mean, stand, mean and standard deviation, and so it is a probability of 0.36, again, four decimal places, so 0.3694. Okay, so just one mark for your probability here. So just being clear about that, it's really important Define the variable if it's not defined for you in the question and define how that um, variable is distributed. Either in methods, it'll only be a normal variable or a binomial vari variable. And the question, in order for you to know that it's normally distributed, the question has to say that. Okay, so you will know that it's a normally distributed variable. Just um, collate the relevant information from the question, mean and standard deviation, variance in this notation, and define the vari variable. Okay. Here we want to look at working backwards. So if we know what the probability is, and we know the mean and the standard deviation, how can we work out what the x value is? Okay. So inverse normal can be used to find what is the x value, Okay. if I know what the probability is and I know what the mean and the standard deviation are. Um, so the key thing though is that inverse normal only finds a probability when it's in this form of x less than or equal to a. It asks for cumulative probability, which means it has to be the probability as we've built up from the left. So if you have a, prob a question that says, find, you know, find um, the value of k so that the probability that x is bigger than k is 0.2, okay, you know that, okay, it's going to be up here somewhere. This prob is telling me that prob area there is 0.2, but you would, in terms of needing to put it in your CAS, you need to reframe it so that it is probability that x is less than or equal to k is 0.8 because 0.8 is the cumulative probability up to k. As we go from left to right, what's the probability? Okay, So it's really important that you can think carefully about the question and what's being asked and that you can turn it around if you need to in order to give the CAS the right information. Okay, let's have a look at some examples.
suppose that z is a standard normal variable, standard normal variable, mean is 0, standard deviation is 1, draw an appropriate diagram and find, correct to two decimal places, so careful about the, the rounding, um, the value of a such that the probability that z is less than a is 0.4. It says draw an appropriate diagram and again that, that's about helping you to think clearly about which probability do you need to put into the calculator. Okay, mean is 0. If we, if we know the probability is 0.4, that's less than half. So that means that A is going to have to be somewhere down here so that we know that this area here is 0.4. Okay, so it's set up in the right direction. Okay, we can find the value of A. So menu 553 for inverse normal. Area is the cumulative area. So from left to right up to the value, what is the probability? In this case, it's 0.4. Um, mean and standard deviation are set again by default to the standard normal variable um, which is what we're looking at here so we can leave those and we find that in this case a is going to be negative um, 0.25 we wanted to two decimal places so it makes sense that it's less than zero um, it's less clearly le clearly less than the mean so it has to be a negative value okay part b we want the probability of z being bigger than or equal to a equal to 0.72 so Again, standard normal variable. We want bigger than or equal to A is 0.72. So therefore, A also has to be below the mean in this case. It's again going to be negative because the area bigger than it has to be 0.72. Okay. Um, and so therefore, in order to answer the question, we need to reframe it so that this is the same as saying the probability that Z is less than A is 0 0.28. and then we can put that information into our calculator. So menu 553, the cumulative area up to A is 0.28, okay, mean and standard deviation are correct. And so A is negative point, and we want two decimal places, negative 0.58. Find the probability that Z is um, bigger than negative, sorry, find negative A is less than um, Z, which is less than A, the probability of that is 0.5. Okay, so this is essentially asking us to find the upper and lower quartiles, okay? Because what this is asking us is, okay, our mean is zero, so therefore negative A and positive A are both symmetrically placed about the mean, okay? and we know that this area in here, we want this area in here to be 50% or 0.5, okay? Which means that we want this area down here to be 0.25 and we want this area up here to be 0.25. So by definition, this is the first quartile, this is the median, and this is the upper quartile. Okay. So in a normal distribution, mean and median are the same thing because the mean is the 50th percentile because it's a perfectly symmetric distribution. So, And we know the um, first quartile, the lower quartile, is the 25th percentile. So that's in this case going to be negative A. And the upper quartile is the 75th percentile, which would be positive A. So we're, we're essentially finding the two quartiles by thinking about the middle 50%. The span of these values would be the interquartile range. All right, so we want to think about how we can use this. So I'm going to use this information down here to find negative A. I know this tells me that the probability that Z is less than negative A is 0.25, or we could use the probability that Z is bigger than, or sorry, less than positive A is 0.75. Okay. So either way, if we use the information on the left, we do just need to be... Um, a little bit careful here because this would tell us, in fact the one on the right is easy, easier to use. If we use the one on the left we would say the area is 0.25, mean and standard deviation are correct. So what that's telling me is that this value here is equal to negative 0.67, what do we want two decimal places? Negative 0.67, but that's equal to negative A. So from this we learn that negative A equals negative 0.67 and that therefore tells us that A is 0.67, okay? So making sure that you answer the question, which is find the value of A, okay? Um, if you use the one on the right, obviously straight away you would get um, the value of A. So menu five, 
um, 5, 3. If we instead gave the area of 0.75, we would straight away get the value of A here as being 0.67. Okay, so just be clear, careful about how you go about doing it. Okay, so then question 5. Example 5. Suppose that x is a normal random variable with a mean of 18 and a standard deviation of 2.5. So no longer a standard normal variable. Draw an appropriate diagram and find correct two decimal places the value of k such that. Okay, here we want the probability that x is less than or equal to k to be 0.65. We know that the mean is 18 and we know that if um, k, the probability x is less than or equal to k is more than half. So therefore k is going to have to be somewhere over here so that we've got more than half of the area. We know that that's 0.65. Okay, so that is the cumulative probability. We can use that straight away to find what is K gonna be. Menu 553, area is 0.65, mean is not zero, mean is 18, standard deviation is 2.5. And so that tells us that K is approximately 18.96, uh, two decimal places, yes. Um, okay, so bigger than 18, that makes sense. Standard deviation is only point, only 2.5, so um, it's not a big standard deviation. Um, so therefore, it's not a lot above 18, the value of k. Okay, probability that x is bigger than k is 0.52, so just over half. So bigger than k, so therefore k is going to be below the mean, but only a little bit below the mean here, because this probability up here has to be 0.52, which means that we know that this bit of probability down here is 0.48. So this is the same as saying the probability that x is less than or equal to k is 0.48. And so therefore, from that information, we can work out k. Menu 553, area is 0.48, mean is 18, and standard deviation is 2.5. 17.87 so again just below 18 so it's the diagrams helpful because if you had forgotten and you'd accidentally just put in the 0.52 here you know it you need to that moment of does my answer make sense okay oh it's bigger than the mean does that make sense and it helps if you've sort of thought through the diagram even if you've just imagined it in your head rather than drawn it on the paper explicitly and um, there was a comment in an examiner's report a couple of years ago now which did did say you know drawing a bell curve and showing relevant areas is relevant working in terms of earning marks for your working. Um, so sometimes that can be an efficient way to do it too. Okay, um, example, let's renumber that. Six, we've done five. Scores obtained on an IQ test are normally distributed with a mean of 100 and standard deviation of 15. If 80% of people get a score higher than C, find the value of C correct to the nearest whole number. Okay, again, I know we did it in a previous example. Let's pretend this is a whole new day, a whole new exam, a whole new whatever. Um, so variables not defined for us here. So we need to introduce a variable. We need to introduce a letter. I'm going to let Q equal IQ score. And therefore, Q is a normally distributed variable with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 2.5. So therefore, a variance of 2.5 squared. Sorry, that's the previous example, wasn't it? 15. So therefore 15 squared. Okay, now we need to accurately interpret this sentence. If 80% of people get a score higher than C, okay, so that is the probability that IQ score, so Q, is higher than C, not higher than or equal to, not at least C, higher than C, has to be equal to 80% or 0.8, okay? Okay. This is the direct interpretation of this line here, and it needs to be correct and it needs to be accurate. Okay, and then we're going to use our CAS to find C. Again, though, we think about well, that's a bigger than probability, so we need to actually use the fact that Q is the probability of Q being less than or equal to C is 0.2. Okay, and so that'll be the probability that goes in the CAS. So menu 553, area is 0.2, not 0.8, mean is 100, and standard deviation is 15. Sorry. And so C is approximately 87 point nearest whole number. So C is approximately 87. Uh, it's an IQ score. 
So we know approximately 80% of people get IQ scores higher than 87. Okay. Um, so what was I going to say there? So yes, we know the mean is 100. So if we're looking for 80% of people to get a score higher than something, we know 50% of people get a score higher than 100. So therefore, it has to be a value that's lower than 100. So that makes sense. Again, if you you know drawn your distribution, had your 100, and you know you want, we know that's 50% above there. So you want 80%. Oh, sorry. So you automatically know that the probability, the value has to be something less than 100. Um, okay, find the scores between which the middle half of the distribution will score. Okay, so we did the same problem in a um, simpler example, uh, sorry, in an example with no context previously. So we want the middle half. So we know 100. So what we want to know is again, what are the values either side of the mean that will make sure that we get 50% in here. Okay, so if we call this, you know, um, A and B, okay, they're not A and negative A here because the mean is 100. So, you know, A is A might be 80 and B might be 120. Okay, that's not, it's not the same number um, with one positive and one negative. So just be careful about that. So we could use two bits of information here. We can either use the fact that we know the probability that, well, we need to find both A and B. So we could do it in a couple of different ways. We could say that the probability of um, X, no, Q, sorry, that variable, Q being less than A um, has to be 0.25. Okay, so that's using the fact that this area over here, that that has to be 0.25. Um, and so from that information, menu 553, area of 0.25, mean of 100, standard deviation of 15. Okay, so again, we want to the, uh, sorry, it hasn't given us an accuracy. Let's again say to the nearest whole number. Um, so let's say that's a score of 90. Okay, so we know that A is approximately 90. And so then you could use the symmetry. So that means that that's 10 there, and so therefore we need B will be 10 above the mean, okay? And so B is going to be approximately 100 plus 10. And that 10 is coming from calculating the difference between the mean and our A value, okay? So it's going to be approximately 110. Or you could have found, so therefore, um, let's just answer the question, so therefore the middle 50% score between um, 90 and 100. Alternatively, we could have found B by saying the probability of Q being less than B is 75%. And from that, so I'm just going to edit my previous line here and change the 0 0.25 to 0.75. That we get that B is approximately 110. So you could have done it that way. And you could have found B first and then used B to find A. Um, however but again thinking about that symmetry the diagram helps you to get that clear in your mind okay all right so the work today is from exercise 16c just practicing using your CAS to find the answers